Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for your interest in the Goulburn Murray Resilience Strategy. This is a piece of work that was commissioned um, and conceived by the Goulburn Regional Partnership, really as a response to what we saw as the lack of a, a coherent overarching policy framework to help the region deal with one of its biggest issues, which is really a lower water future. And that was the context that we started this, kick this project off in. A lower water future in this part of the world is driven by some serious externalities, uh, climate change primarily amongst them, but also environmental recovery under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and even inter-valley transfers, where the water um, from this part of the region transferred downstream to support horticulture in Sunraysia in South Australia. That unique combination of pressures, unique to this part of the world, um, really was starting to have a significant impact on our agricultural base, primarily irrigation, but then all the interrelationships that come with that, and then our economy, obviously, and our communities as well. So the partnership embarked on what we started to call the GMID master plan process. The GMID um, is an area in Northern Victoria um, that stretches basically from Yarrawonga in the east right through to Swan Hill in the west. And you'll see the irrigation district in green there, but obviously supporting a lot of dry land uh, agriculture through the white areas as well. We convened a group of about 150 to 200 people in Moama um, to talk about what a lower water future means for this region in the context of developing a master plan. And we did what everybody always does when they start these projects. We got out the butcher's paper and we got out the yellow sticky notes and we did the regional SWOT analysis supported by a literature review of all the things we already knew. And after a couple of hours of that process, um, we had everything up on the wall, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats, and we all stood back to review our work. And there was a real sense of um, deflation in the room. There was some open frustration in the room. There was nothing new up there. All the strengths of the inherent strengths of the region were well understood. The challenges in the, um, were, were really well, completely well understood and right in front of us and manifesting in some areas as crisis, even though these things had been understood for some time. The opportunities the region had were pretty well articulated and the threats were really well known as well, the exacerbated climate change and further water leaving the region. So at that point, and some people in the room were not actually rebelling, but starting to say, well, are we really gonna do the same thing again? So we stepped back from it all and we thought, what does this all mean? The SWAT for the region is well known, there's no surprises there. How do we actually stop this process falling into the same trap that all the other processes that we've been part of before did? Which really we thought st started to talk about overdefining a likely future, which is probably going to be a bit wrong, which leads to false signals to everyone who's trying to self organise around that articulated likely future, and then wasted time and effort and resources going to that point when in fact that's not where we're going. So, we committed to the room to come back on the, on the back of all that feedback and not do the same again. We reconvened a few months later and presented the challenges and opportunities um, which we'd already articulated in a different framework and contemplated them in a through a resilience lens. And we started to talk to the people in the room who were all people who were trying to live and work in the region and with long history in the region, Yes, there were government people there, there were bureaucrats, there were water authorities, catchment man management authorities, people from AgVic, but there were a lot of farmers in the room, there were a lot of business people in the room, there were a lot of people from professional services in the room, all starting to think, we need to think about these challenges and opportunities radically differently. And we started to talk to them at the second meeting about resilience. And quietly, we dropped off the master plan um, ethos. Claire, over to you. So resilience is a way of thinking about a system and the system is a useful fi fiction that we use to help us manage complexity and the Golden Murray is a complex and dynamic system. So we've drawn this artificial boundary that David talked to you about earlier and the definition of resilience that we're using for this project is that it is the capacity of a system to cope with change while creating opportunities towards a shared vision. And that shared vision is kind of the shared understanding in this region of what is important to the region, what we'd like to maintain and the things that we would like to change. And so it's really important to, to acknowledge that resilience is misunderstood by many people in communities and government, so much so that it actually makes some people flinch because of the way it's been applied in the past. It's not about dogged survival and blind acceptance of the negative or destructive. It's about being prepared to cope with 
unknown and known challenges. And it's about being able to take advantage of the opportunities associated with change and knowing where and how to intervene. So this strategy um, has been developed by local leaders based on a whole lot of uh, consultation across the Golden Murray region and ideas across the Golden Murray region who wish to collaborate and work together with government, with each other, to develop the resilience of their regional system using this definition. It's very much a place-based approach. It's based on local people understanding the drivers of change and knowing what will work in their area and wanting to know more about what might work in their area. And what we're trying to do with this approach is acknowledge that we can either drift along and accept whatever comes our way in the future, or we can do some things to shape our trajectory. So what we're using is the iceberg model um, to demonstrate that it is most effective to intervene deeply within the system from persistence through adaptation, transformation. As communities, government, business, whoever we are, as human beings, we tend to default to operating above that waterline that you can see there. We respond to immediate impacts of shocks like uh, pandemics, bushfires, fish kills, whatever the shock might be. We look at the, we, we make our policy responses and our infrastructure responses based on those immediate short term things. But unless we start working below the waterline, the shocks will continue to present, we'll see the same asset condition because we aren't dealing with the root cause of the issues. This insight is really familiar to effective policymakers, and scientists and educators who know that the worldviews and systemic structures um, like legislation or uh, community attitudes can have profound and long lasting effects. While it's easier and faster to work above the waterline, we know in the Gold Murray region that we need to do the harder things to make significant and lasting change in the Gold Murray region. However, it's a complex system, as we talked about earlier, and that means that the changes we make can have unexpected consequences. And we can't really predict what will happen from various interventions. And that's why the Goulburn Murray region really wants to use the resilience approach, which is based on very well researched resilience principles. Over to you, David. When we put this uh, chart, or that, that slide, up on the screen uh, in our second meeting, it generated a lot of energy in the room and a lot of conversations popped up straight away because people could look at that and really understand where they were and what their mindset was. And they could look around and recognise where their neighbours were and what their mindset was and colleagues and, and allied businesses as well. And I think all of a sudden there was that light bulb moment. Yes, that's why all this stuff feels like Groundhog Day. That's why we're so frustrated at this treadmill of dealing with the crisis of the day that we've known about these things re-emerging over time, we're up in the persistence mindset. And some of them even looked around the room and understood um, that some people there were even in a, um, a resistance mindset where they just really wanted to pretend that this wasn't happening at all. So there's another layer above persist, which is resist. And they could see everybody and, and they could really place them on this spectrum of resilience thinking, I think. It's, it's a very powerful piece. The other thing that is missing on that, on that uh, slide is the fact that the reason, key reason, it's harder and slower, but ultimately stronger to work below the waterline and deeper through the adaptation and into transformation is it, be, it involves behavioural change from humans. The deeper you want to go, more, the more you need people to, the deeper you want to go, the more you need people to change their behaviours and existing patterns. Um, and that is hard work, but that is what leads to the enduring change. On the back of that light bulb moment where they thought, yes, we've got to get out of that little circular uh, treadmill at the top and go below the waterline. We then brought in some uh, resilience experts and practitioners to help us work through best practice and the, the best thinking we could get from around the world about what works in regional communities around resilience thinking and building resilience. We developed over a series of workshops, this series of eight resilience principles. And these have been tested and these are what resonates for our part of the world in Northern Victoria. Even though these have come from best practice, they've been tailored to what works for us and what resonates with our people on the ground here. And just quickly running through those, developing a complexity perspective. Um, that is really understanding that we are in, in a complex interrelated system and a policy change in agriculture will impact in the fullness of time um, on education and health, and likewise through the chain. 
economic interventions will have social impacts, social interventions will have, will have economic impacts. That takes a lot more intellectual rigour in the setup of the policy development, but that is actually what builds stronger regions over time. Developing governance that embraces change is really important. This is about leadership and structures that are much more comfortable with uncertainty than they've ever been before. Not only do they not let uncertainty slow them down, they have to find a way and a way of facilitating and fostering development of policy and thoughtful projects that understand that the future is unknown and becoming probably more unknown day by day. There are organisations that in the face of those risks and uncertainty, lockdown behaviour and more narrowly defined projects and outcomes and paths and goals. That is not what's needed to set up regions for their best future. Fostering cohesion, self-organisation and local responsibility. This is the piece that says, this is about a way of thinking and a movement, whether everybody knows they're part of it or not, there needs to be the ground roots, the grassroots and ground up sort of approach to this, understanding into a receptive and welcoming policy framework. Um, if anyone thinks that they own the resilience strategy or if it's left to government to implement, then it's going to fail, of course. Not only is it everything needs broad buy-in, we say that about everything, but this way of acting and this way of thinking and designing your business and your personal activity and your enterprise for the future, it has to come from the grassroots up and equally from the top down, there's got to be that welcoming policy environment. Designing for flexibility is very important. We've all seen too many projects, particularly infrastructure projects, but other things as well, where they've fallen into the policy hubris of over-defining a likely future. And as we've said, all of a sudden, the regions and individuals and enterprises start to self-organise around those signals from government. And guess what? They're not always quite right. And all of a sudden, the suboptimal outcomes and there's things that we didn't know were going to impact on each other because of the lack of complexity perspective. And all of a sudden, there can be a self-fulfilling negative feedback loop on policy interventions that haven't quite worked out. And I think we can all think of a few examples of those that are probably still running today. Managing networks and connectivity, again, being aware and being alert to sort of shifting system dynamics because these things do change over time. Managing networks of connect and connectivity within those systems and between them crucially um, is often the missing piece in, in building resilience. Valuing, retaining and building response and recovery capacity. This is a piece about allowing buffers and flexibility in policy and system design and infrastructure design. Short-term efficiency and the drive towards short-term efficiency is often the enemy of long-term resilience. And we've seen infrastructure projects that have missed the mark that have taken years and cost a lot of money and didn't hit the desired outcome. Yes, there were some good things that happened along the way and it wasn't all lost, but it didn't actually do what we thought it was gonna do in the first place. It's been very narrowly defined with tight budgets and firm deadlines. That level of rigor and robustness is very, very important. This isn't an open check checkbook sort of um, pitch, but we need to actually design and build in much greater buffer and flexibility than we're used to. And that's gonna take a bit of policy bravery as well and bravery from government to say, we're gonna value a bit of flexibility in this. This is the trajectory piece, not the narrow future piece. Focusing on flow variables, leverage and tipping points. The best example we can give here is the, the slow moving tectonic shift of climate change and how it impacts on agriculture in the regions how it impacts on our economies and our communities, and drought manifesting as crisis within the context of that slow moving climate change. And understanding that sometimes regions, commodity sectors, industry groups, even some towns, reach a tipping point within that slow moving context where they actually can't recover. We need to be put a lot of effort into understanding when we're approaching those tipping points. Um, this is moving, the, uh, changing the tyres on a moving car. This is working at multiple speeds and levels within each piece of policy development and really having our radar on for tipping points and elements of, um, of vulnerability in our communities and our economic settings. Learning for change is absolutely fundamental. This is actually bringing best practice into our, into our thinking. This is sharing our wins and our losses. This is helping each other in, in building the movement around what resilience means and how to implement it in a regional area. It won't happen by itself. It needs support, it needs facilitation, it needs some backbone, it needs an identifiable centre that people can come towards and work with over time. Having developed those resilience principles, we then started to think about 
what can we do in this region that actually will build resilience in that context against those sort of those principles? And there was a series of ideas that came forward, again, a, a massive grab bag of things from all sorts of areas. And RMCG through Clear started to aggregate these up into five key theme areas, which we ended up calling intervention streams. And I'll let Claire talk to each of these. So we've got these five areas that came out and they're, they're really clearly of this region. And I think that's really important. While the, the vision that a person, that a region might come up with could be applied across different areas, these five things really speak to the Gold Murray region. Um, and they are all, all the intervention streams and the interventions within them are based on the eight principles that David just talked us through. So we've got the Futures of Agriculture is based on the understanding and the, the desire for this region to continue to be really dependent on agriculture um, and for the future of agriculture to be diverse and to embody those eight principles. The same is true for natural and built assets. The things that a region has, both its natural assets and the things that we as humans have put there, they really shape the resilience of a region. So we need to focus on those for the Golden Murray region. Leadership and coordination, as David talked about, this is the important piece that's often missing when we're talking about resilience. And we need to think about those in a really collaborative way and think about how we're gonna work on embedding those principles within everything that we do within the Golden Murray region. The circular economy acknowledges that there is a heck of a lot of resource um, being wasted in the Golden Murray region. Uh, David's probably got the figures to mind, but there is an enormous amount of biomass that is just being wasted that would be a resource for other industries and that coordination is missing and the opportunity for people to try things is really missing. And it's important to know that circular economy, this isn't just recycling rebranded, this is something a lot deeper than that about connecting resources to the people who can use it to make something really valuable for the region. And then finally, learning for change. That's that final principle in action. What we know is we can't predict the future. As people, we are actually dreadful at predicting the future, but it doesn't make us ever stop trying. So we have to do things that will work in a range of futures, whether that's our infrastructure or our policy. And then we have to learn from what we do and improve that in this iterative way. That's the really, really crucial bit of it. So we'll talk you through some of those interventions and what they look like. David, did you want to talk about a couple of these? Yes, yeah, so just at a high level, Claire, there's an there's a enormous amount of detail between these. So as we said, there was a, a range of ideas that came forward. And what we needed to do is really put them through that those, the, the, the pressure test of those resilience principles, I suppose. Were these um, ideas, policies and projects that were mutually reinforcing and building resilience in the region, were they contributing to resilience or not? There's a lot of good policies and a lot of good projects that, yes, should be done, that don't neatly fall into that. But for our purposes and trying to actually, our core focus, helping the region deal with a low water future by building a more resilient landscape and community, these things had to be tick several of those resilience boxes and they had to have some element of being mutually reinforcing across the others. So what we say about this suite of, of interventions here, this is the first flush of what's come forward. Some of these will disappear, new ones will come in. Some will become a lot bigger than we think at the moment and other, others will shrink significantly. But that's why this, it's a way of thinking, it's not a lockdown document and it's not a lockdown strategy. It's a framework, a policy development framework and no regrets framework. There is no downside to developing policy in, in accordance with those resilience principles to the best extent that everybody can. Then all of a sudden we've got that welcoming and receptive policy framework and, and environment where private capital can start to self-organise um, around a broad range of futures. So each of these touches on the five intervention streams that, uh, that Claire talked about before. There are some that are relatively straightforward. There are some that are quite ambitious, some philosophical in nature and some quite mundane. But the critical thing is that we've formed the view that they're mutually reinforcing, they help each other and they touch on multiple of those resilience principles. Um, for argument's sake, in the futures of agriculture there, we have one about agricultural redevelopment coordination. Now, this is a long-standing problem about private capital being unable to find a good footprint in the context of our irrigation network because it was substantially designed 100 years ago, significantly reworked in the last decade, but still not exactly meeting the needs of the future of agriculture. And even though this is one of the best places in Australia to farm for many commodities, 
corporate ag and serious money is not coming here because our landscape isn't receptive to it. Actually giving some coordination to that, a one source of truth, a one-stop shop where developers um, can come and talk about what their ambitions in the region might be, or even those within the region who seek, seek to grow can go and actually get some advice as well. Those sorts of things can be the catalyst for a lot more resilience stuff that spins out of the side of it. I'll get Claire to talk about some of the funds that come through here, and this is probably going to be one of the hardest pieces for us to advocate for, I think, because asking for assistance for funds to allow good things to happen. Um, gee, you can see people's eyes glaze over when you're, <laughs> when you're asking for something like that. But without the opportunity to seed these things, to coordinate them, to herd them and to provide the feedback, it's just going to fail. I'll be another grab bag of projects. Claire, you might want to talk about the reason that under each of these intervention streams, there actually is a, 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 a box, a fund and a seed bank. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, David. The, the way that we've set this up, and you'll see that there is a common thread in the interventions, and these are the foundation interventions that will change over time, as David was saying. But there is coordination in A1, um, the, all of the B learning for change ones have them. The circular economy has coordination, um, and that's leadership and coordination. It's in the very title. As David said right at the beginning, coordination is missing. And that coordination is going in the instance of this, these foundation, foundation interventions. The coordination is going hand in hand with funds because no one group will own and deliver this strategy. It can't be that way. As David has said over and over, if one group owns it, it won't happen and it won't build resilience. The diversity of implementation and design and ownership is what makes this successful. And that relies on there being those funds, the Regional Resilience Fund for Futures of Agriculture, the Circular Economy Seed Fund, the, seed, uh, the Regional Resilience Fund for Natural Assets. What we really need is for people to be able to have a go at, at, um, at applying those resilience principles in a variety of ways that we haven't thought of yet. And we need to give them some support to do that and to have a go at maybe, and you know, people flinch at this word, it's the F word, failure, some things will fail and that's okay. Um, some people call that learning, but you have to do something, try, work out what does and doesn't work and then scale up the things that do work, adjust the things that didn't work. And if we don't fund people to have a go at that, they will keep on on the cycles that that you know, above the waterline doing what they've always done. And the coordination is what ensures people are applying the principles. So those things really, really go hand in hand. And without both of them, the approach will just avert to business as usual. And let's face it, Claire, some things fail anyway, even in the absence of this sort of thinking. So again, with no regrets policy framework, why wouldn't you allow some flexibility to try something different when we've been throwing up substantially the same answers built from the same way of thinking to the same problems for quite some time in Northern Victoria, and we haven't seen the change that's needed. <clears throat> so on the back of those foundation interventions, um, they ran through the intervention streams, they speak directly to the principles. We see this as a coherent policy development framework, and also a piece of thinking that enterprises and individuals can self-organise around going forward and to operate and thrive in this region in the future. In the context of a lower water future, yes, but also in the context of any other unexpected externalities. You know, this will allow the region, if it comes into its fullness and, 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 and takes root over time, to deal more adequately with those external shocks. A lot of the economy in the community will continue to thrive and the area that's impacted most heavily will actually um, get some support around it and it will go forward in a, in a better way than it has in the past. In the past, some of these externalities have, all, have almost shut the region down for an extended period. That's the lack of resilience that's brought us to this way of thinking. Critically now, we come to governance and what's going to carry this forward. Now, our thinking at this stage is um, that the community board needs to be at the heart of this. There needs to be people in the region with their private capital in the region working and, um, and living and, um, and recreating in the region at the heart of this. Again, we're trying to take it half a step away from government, even though government is crucial here. We think that community board should be drawn um, from people across the region, from different networks with different skill sets. 
they'll report into government what we think through the regional partnership structure. So each of the regional partnerships that are, uh, go across the, the Goulburn Murray footprint, being Loddon, Compassby, Goulburn in the central area and Mallee, um, will have representation on this community board. And they will start to set up place-based resilience groups um, where there's a, a, a geographical or a landscape element to these things. They'll, to, they'll set up the resilience stream forums. Some of the people that we've spoken to about this way of thinking in this project have been a bit challenged. Yes, we're already doing that, that's our role. You know, we've already tried that, we've got a strategy like that. Well, that's terrific. Here's your chance to actually work within this whole uh, wider framework. You've already got a place-based resilience group going, whether you knew it or not. That's the start of something that can we can build the learnings and apply them more widely across the region. Um, and you can see them start to think, oh, well, I don't have to be challenged by this. You know, I can interact with this where it suits us when it makes sense and actually start to get some mutual benefits from being part of a broader way of thinking with some support, backbone and feedback, secretariat support. The stream forums actually are more narrowly focused on the areas of particular interest and they will emerge and recede over time as needed. The output will obviously um, interact significantly with government at a local level, at a state level and a, level and a federal level. It's really important to us that state bureaucrats and policy makers, federal bureaucrats and policy makers and local government operatives understand what we're trying to achieve when we talk about things that work within these resilience principles that speak to these resilience ambitions and are part of this framework and way of thinking. That is the receptive and welcoming policy framework that we really need. The last page now, I think, brings us to our final slide, which is the role of government. And I might ask Claire to say a few words about this, perhaps to sum up, because she's a lot more eloquent than I am. But for me, I just see as a layman uh, living and working in the region, we need government to be a lot more comfortable with uncertainty than they've been in the past. To avoid that policy hubris of over-defining a local likely future and driving the region towards a narrow outcome. And if we don't get it quite right, we know what the impact of that can be. As I said before, you'll all have a, a swag of those tucked away in our memory bank about things that didn't hit the mark, about projects that should have evolved and reshaped and shifted significantly over time in the same way that ours did. We wanted to design a master plan and we've came very quickly to the realisation that was just entirely wrong and it cut across all the things that the region really needed. But I tell you what, People in several areas of government love the idea of a master plan. That helped them organise in a really narrow way. We stepped back from that and said, we want to talk about resilience building and resilience principles. And trying to engage their attention at that point was quite challenging. And we really needed to go re reinforcing master planning isn't going to work. We've had a lot of master plans and they didn't work. We want to step back and think more broadly and deeply about this stuff. Avoiding that policy hubris, as I call it. And importantly, just reinforcing once again, that welcoming policy environment that understands what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve a re resilient landscape, economy and communities in this part of the world going forward. When we are seriously challenged by a low water future, yes, everywhere is impacted by climate change. We're also significantly impacted by environmental recovery and significantly impacted by intervalley transfers downstream. There are a unique combination of pressures coming onto this region that mean it is seriously challenged and the old way of thinking is just not going to cut it. Claire. Thanks, David. So the role of government is clearly to partner with the region. It's to partner with that private capital that Dave's been talking about. It's to support communities, support industries, to do what government does best, create the conditions, the legislative environment that support resilience. And we, we're asking you to um, support the governance structure and these interventions through funding, connections, delivery support. We're asking you to support a learning approach where we try new things, learn from failures and scale up the successes. Government plays a really powerful role in supporting the resilience or otherwise of regions, of driving innovation. And it's really, really um, important for government to step up into this role. So thank you. Thank you very much for your interest.